Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see uh, so many familiar faces and some new folks I still need to meet. My name is Jim Elser. I'm the director of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance and also professor at Arizona State University. And I've also been the principal investigator for something called the National Science Foundation Research Coordination Network on phosphorus sustainability, of which this event is a part. So uh, I also want to thank, so I'm thanking you all for coming. I also want to thank our sponsors, including the National Science Foundation and all the organizations and companies that you see on the screen here who are pioneers in phosphorus sustainability, um, who are members of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. And we'll be telling you more about that, that shortly. So uh, we have a great day ahead of us and a lot of interesting perspectives to share and hopefully a lot of connections to make amongst each other, uh, all in the service of uh, advancing the cause of, of responsible, sustainable phosphorus use uh, in the food system and in the environment. So um, I'm just going to walk through a few ideas, um, tell you a little bit about how we got here, and then um, try to set the stage for the, the information we're going to get from the rest of the program. So when I was thinking about the phosphorus sustainability challenge, this expression came to mind, you know, trying to square a circle. I didn't really know where that expression came from, so I Googled it and found a definition of it. And so I think it's, a, you know, I, I think it's really appropriate for what we're trying to do. It's a, trying to find a good solution to a problem that seems impossible, especially because the people involved have very different needs or opinions about it. So. Uh, there are a lot of interests of different kinds, but uh, the common interest I think we all have is the benefit for humanity and the human well-being, whether it's respect to food supply, having abundant nutritious food, and having abundant, healthy, clean drinking water and aquatic biodiversity. Those things are all the things that we want, and so those are our common goals as we attempt to square the circle of phosphorus sustainability. So there's problems, though, out there. We've been seeing a lot of headlines. This is one some of you know about. This is the crisis at the Mosaic operation in Florida where they had a sinkhole form and lost um, a lot of material into groundwater. Um, so that's, that's not something you want to see in the headlines. You also don't want to see this in the headlines. This is the algal blooms in, in South Florida again um, in uh, the Miami Fort Lauderdale area um, with algal blooms um, causing problems uh, on, with uh, ever, with uh, recreational use and amenity of, of coastal areas there. So reeking oozy algae is also not a headline we would like to see. Here's another one you probably want to see, airborne hog manure. So this is just a couple of weeks ago. I found this one. It's a legal dispute between a hog growing operation and its neighbors that was still being litigated, I believe, but the, but the homeowners brought environmental DNA analysis to the table to demonstrate that what was on their homes had hog DNA in it. So uh, in any case, this is also a headline we would really like to avoid. And that's just part of a broader set of headlines many of us are struggling with, many in this community are struggling with, and that is uh, manure management and, uh, and how uh, we can make better use of, of this resource in such a way that it becomes a resource and not so much of a problem. So there's a lot of litigation pending uh, regarding um, this kind of uh, topic. And this, is, of course, is a um, headline we'd like to see go away over time. So these are headlines we've been seeing, unfortunately. Here's a headline we don't usually see, unfortunately. Right? The other side of phosphorus fertilizer. Billions did not starve. Breaking news, right? Because there is fertilizer available, we can have high crop yields and, and, and feed a greater a number of people and keep them and ensure their food security. So this is, but this is not a headline we often see, but it's one that we should always appreciate when we think about fertilizer uh, and, uh, and phosphorus. So. Um, Let's hope we can get more attention on that side of the story as well. All right, so here's the circle that we need to square that we've just highlighted for you. These are um, the sustainable two, some of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Number two is to achieve zero hunger globally. So we have to increase food production by 100%, 70%, disputes about how much it's going to have to go up by 2050 or so, but no matter what number you choose, it's a large number. So we need to expand agricultural production, 
and do it in a way um, that doesn't compromise the other sustainable development goals, right? On the right-hand side, clean water and sanitation and um, life below water, biological diversity and fisheries in uh, lakes and coastal systems. So those are, that's the circle that we're uh, um, responsible for squaring or, or society needs to square somehow by, um, by deliberate or, or uh, market action. Um, and so it's a hard problem and we see that the problem has phosphorus right at the center of both those problems. Phosphorus is essential for achieving the food security we're after, but it's also driving um, deterioration of water quality in many situations. There's improvements being made. There's a lot of good practices that are being implemented. We're being able to produce more food for a given amount of phosphorus uh, uh, application. So we're making good progress in phosphorus management, but problems uh, still remain. We need to make faster progress and uh, make sure that we can continue to uh, achieve or achieve those sustainable development goals. So there's been a lot of people working on this uh, over the years, and I would say that there's been something we might call the phosphorus sustainability movement, as uh, we might even brand it. And there's been a lot of stuff going back all the way to the early 2000s with Sarah 17 group uh, out of the USDA and different global initiatives over time. Um, the operation that brings you here today got started in around 2011 when we sponsored the International Phosphorus Summit, which was was, was chaired by Carl Wyatt, who's sitting right over there in the back from Helena Chemicals when he was a graduate student. He uh, organized that meeting. And that turned into a National Science Foundation grant for a research coordination network on phosphorus sustainability that I am the PI of that I mentioned. And in turn, as we see, that produced something called the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance that is, uh, is organizing today's uh, Phosphorus Forum. So there's been a lot of stuff going on internationally in this domain, people taking different perspectives, social science perspectives, engineering perspectives, agro agronomic perspectives, and others. And so Phosphorus Sustainability RCN is what brings us today. We've been meeting for about five years now. Our goal is to support the development of a closed human phosphorus cycle and a more sustainable food system by bringing all the players together that are involved in that, in that uh, enterprise. And so uh, the output has been what scientists usually do. And engineers, usually academics, usually do write papers, have workshops, talk to each other. Um, and so that's all been good. We've been very productive uh, in that regard, and I'm going to share some of those results with you today. But we also wanted to do some other things as well. So here's a timeline of, of the events that we've been having. Some of you have attended previous versions of the Phosphorus Forum here in DC. We had one two years ago and one five years ago when the project began. But the groups have been uh, working uh, hard in synthesizing a lot of diverse information. I'm just going to breeze past a few of the studies that have come out. There will be a bit more detail on some of these shortly from some of the working group panels that are going to talk later. We had a really beautiful analysis of uh, the accumulation of phosphorus in river basins, three major river, river basins of the world as fertilizer was brought uh, into the system and accumulating in, in soils and other places in the catchment. This so-called legacy phosphorus, which we're now aware of, changes the time scales that we need to think about with respect to phosphorus management. Here's one that you'll hear more about at the panel from Brooke Meyer, total value of phosphorus recovery. So when we're looking at waste materials, which are resources actually, there's multiple resources in waste streams, energy, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, and other chemical elements that are useful for society that can be monetized and, uh, and turned into a product. So Brooke will be talking about that later. Here's another sort of similar approach by Paul Withers, who's sitting over somewhere in here as well. Uh, uh, green chemistry. So there's all kinds of ways that chemical advances are needed to uh, come to the table to develop um, high value products from what are currently um, uh, uh, waste materials, if you will, if either steel slag or low-grade phosphate rock or animal manures and crop residues, all of which can be turned into value, valuable products by processes of chemical innovation that many um, of you in this room are actually applying already. So those are what we've been doing. We're in the five-year stage of this process. We've written a lot of papers, about 50 of them, but we wanted to have more lasting value, non-academic value, 
And so the next step of the Phosphorus RCN was to create this thing we're calling the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. Previously, you may have heard of something called the North American Partnership for Phosphorus Sustainability. That was its previous name. We shortened it. <laughs> and, um, and so this is now the final name, the Phosphorus Alliance. And um, it is a member organization modeled on the European Sustainable Phosphorus Platform that you will learn about later this morning from Chris Thornton. These are the founding members and some of our preliminary uh, members of this organization. It's a fee-based organization that drives the operation and supports um, Matt Schultz, who you have uh, been corresponding with, for him to pull all this effort together. And so um, I certainly invite everyone here who might want to get involved in private industry or NGO, world or academic side of things to consider joining this. And there's material about that, and I'm happy to talk to you about it uh, in person myself. Uh, the alliance is meant to facilitate networking, like the event we're having today, that can bring together from the different sectors who need to talk to each other and work things out. We are networking also over the web in different sorts of communication modes. We're going to be generating working groups on focused topics that are of interest to the membership. And we're going to be offering a branding opportunity to people who want to uh, present their organization as being at the forefront of phosphorus sustainability effort. So here's what we're going to do today as I wrap up. Uh, we're going to have a, a keynote uh, address by Steve Bro from Nutrient. They're going to see some summaries from our phosphorus RCN groups. Chris Thornton will tell us about the European Sustainable Phosphorus Platform. We'll be hungry by then and we'll need to eat something, so we're going to get lunch and a good chance to meet each other again. And then we'll have two panel discussions, um, one about the phosphorus recovery side of the phosphorus challenge and the other panel about the phosphorus efficiency side of the phosphorus challenge in crop production. And um, I'm looking forward to those, okay? So hopefully there'll be a lot of chances for you to ask questions and discuss things and meet other people uh, as well.